Think you know about Batman? Then try answering these three questions. Number one, which actor almost had a Batman movie called Dark Knight before Christian Bale did? Number two, which Batman movie almost had a giant penny in the Batcave? And number three, what legendary rock composer wrote songs for an unmade Batman musical? If you don't know the answers, stick around for five things you didn't know about Batman. show from superhero stuff you should know by Superhouse. This is Ben Juan, the man who knows too much about Batman. And we are in the Ben Cave, or as my co-host Andrew likes to call it, the Bat Bunga Bunga Lounge. Whoa. And these are five things you didn't know about Batman. Number five. We almost got a Halloween Batman movie with George Clooney fighting Scarecrow and Man Bat. Now, when most people talk about a fifth Batman movie from the 90s, they're usually talking about Batman Unchained, though many people misreport that title to be Batman Triumphant. Batman Unchained would have had Clooney's Batman fight Nicolas Cage's Scarecrow and Harley Quinn, who was reimagined as the Joker's daughter, with Madonna and Courtney Love considered for the roles. But after Joel Schumacher left and WB pulled the plug on Batman Unchained, there was another script considered that would have continued the franchise called Batman Dark Knight. Dark Knight spelled as one word. It was written by writers Lee Shapiro and Stephen Wise. This would have had Clooney's Batman come out of retirement when Dick Grayson is thrown into Arkham Asylum by his professor, Jonathan Crane. Along the way, Batman and Robin would have found allies with one of Crane's former colleagues, Dr. Kirk Langstrom, whom Crane had turned into Man Bat. Together, all three would have fought Crane's alter ego, the Scarecrow. The script, written around 1999, was the first to have Jonathan Crane as a psychiatrist at Arkham Asylum, as well as feature a sequence with the Scarecrow on horseback. Sound familiar? It's a great script with probably the most fleshed out version of Scarecrow I've read, and a fantastic take on Man Bat. The script can actually be found and bought in paperback form online. Number four, Batman almost had a radio show in the 1940s. That's right, in the 40s, radio was the main form of entertainment, and in 1940, there was the debut of The Adventures of Superman, starring Clayton Bud Collier. Trying to duplicate the success, a radio pilot for Batman in 1943 was written called The Case of the Drowning Seal, which would have been the first adaptation of Robin's origins, and had Dick Grayson's parents turn out to be undercover FBI agents in the circus who get killed by the Nazis. Batman was voiced by actor Scott Douglas, who strangely would take on the choice of having Batman put on a British accent when he donned the cape and cowl. The pilot, however, was never made, and Batman and Robin instead became recurring characters on The Adventures of Superman in 1946. In that version, the dynamic duo actually fought crime in Metropolis rather than Gotham and worked with Inspector and Henderson rather than Commissioner Gordon. It was also the first instance of Robin wearing a hood as part of his costume, the first produced adaptation of Robin's origin, where the Graysons were killed by their ringmaster, the first adaptation of the Bat Boat, and the very first team-up of Batman and Superman seven years before the comics did it. Number three, Batman Forever almost had the classic giant penny in the Batcave. According to our interview with screenwriters Lee and Janet Scott Batchelor, the Batcave in Batman Forever almost had that famous giant penny from the comics as an Easter egg, but it was cut. Also cut was a sequence that better explained the origin of the Riddler's costume, with Edward Nygma stalking Bruce Wayne and Chase Meridian at the circus and stealing a leprechaun outfit from a performer as a disguise. The leprechaun suit would then form the basis for the Riddler costume. This idea would actually be from Joel Schumacher. Contrary to popular belief, Batman Forever never started as a Tim Burton project. It was always Joel Schumacher's baby. According to what The Bachelors told us, Tim Burton's only involvement was hiring the screenwriters and recommending Joel to direct. That's why Burton is credited as a producer. Otherwise, it was Joel Schumacher, not Tim Burton, as many report, who wanted Michael Keaton to return to play Batman, Rene Russo to play Dr. Chase Meridian, and of course, Robin Williams to play the Riddler, with The Bachelors and Schumacher tailoring the script to cater to Williams. But, as history showed, it was not meant to be for those three actors, and Val Kilmer stepped into the role of Batman, Nicole Kidman was Chase Meridian, and Jim Carrey was the Riddler. Number two. Bob Kane tried to write his own Batman script treatment in 1986. During the 10-year journey of developing the 1989 Batman film, Batman's credited creator, Bob Kane, tried his hand at writing a script treatment titled The Return of Batman. At that point, 
Warner Brothers had already gone through many scripts, some by Tom Mankiewicz from Superman the Movie, as well as two treatments by acclaimed comic book writer Steve Englehart. Tim Burton even had a hand in writing a treatment with Julie Hickson. Bob Kane, however, wrote his own treatment on what he thought the movie should be, insisting that the main villain be the Joker, but also going as far as to propose that if that didn't work out, a good alternative villain would be Man Bat. In his treatment, Kane had Batman and Robin fight Catwoman and the Joker in a script that frankly makes 1997's Batman and Robin look like a masterpiece. It had no plot, cheesy dialogue, scenes and subplots that went nowhere, and an over-sexualized take on Catwoman that Kane would hoped would attract a quote-unquote 10-plus actress to the role. And by 10-plus, I don't think he was talking about acting ability. Thankfully, this never happened, nor was it taken seriously, and Burton hired writer Sam Hamm to write what would become the 1989 classic. And number one, there was almost a Batman musical based on the Tim Burton Batman films. Yes, in the 1990s, rock legend Jim Steinman, who contributed classics like Total Eclipse of the Heart, Holding Out for a Hero, and Bat Out of Hell, set out to do a musical based off the Tim Burton Batman movies, with Burton himself even lined up to direct the production. While it was never made, there are demo tapes on YouTube of the songs featuring Batman, Catwoman, and the Joker, even featuring one where the Joker asks, where does he get those wonderful toys? If you know the answers, then you make a joyful noise, and where does he get all those wonderful toys? Steinman's take on Catwoman actually foreshadowed what we'd see in the TV show Gotham, adding that on the night that Jack Napier shot Bruce Wayne's parents, Selina was a street urchin who witnessed the murders. Seeing how quickly Martha Wayne's pearls could be taken away, Selina sought to collect everything she wanted and make it hers, turning her into the thief Catwoman. The musical was never produced, but some of the songs would later be reused for Steinman's musicals Dance of the Vampires and Bat Out of Hell the Musical. And with that, those were five things you didn't know about Batman. Please check out the Superhero Stuff You Should Know podcast, where we go into all five of those things into much more detail. The links to each episode are in the description below. If you're able, please join our Patreon. Here's a shout out to our current Patreon patrons. And as always, please like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Ben Juan. Thanks for joining me in the Ben Cave.